Hello, this is meeting 12 of the visual tools group where different uh, tooling creators and users collaborate on closure visual tools. And today we'll have Ryan talking about Data Rabbit. And we'll begin by introducing ourselves. So maybe each one of us will just tell a little bit uh, something. Um, and yeah, maybe uh, Maurizio, would you like to tell about yourself? even though you're famous. Sure, okay, so I'm Mauricio. I work mostly in Clojure Script now. I, we used to be like a Clojure developer mostly, but now it's almost everything in Clojure Script. I currently am maintaining Chlorine for the Atom editor and Clover for the visual, for the VS Code editor and also and that's the big thing. I am also maintaining a fork of Atom currently, which means I have so much work to do to type modernize and avoid the editor being killed by Microsoft. But anyway, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, and maybe Santiago, would you tell us something? Sure, hi hey guys. Um... I'm Santiago, I'm a data scientist working in Berlin. I work mostly with R, but um, I've done a couple of things in Clojure and we are currently building up our machine learning team um, with a Clojure base. So we are still doing like the data science part actually in R and some Python stuff, but we want to start deploying and doing all of the things surrounding the data science bits in Clojure. Um, just as a base to then launch like a full closure um, implementation. Um, so I think this is my first time in this visual meeting. I'm really looking forward to the rabbit, little rabbit, because the stuff on Twitter was awesome. Gave me a lot of ideas. Fantastic. Yeah, and maybe Robert, uh, would you tell about yourself? Yeah. Oh. Maybe you're on mute at the moment. Oh, uh, never mind. I'll, I'll ask you a bit later. Um, yeah, uh, Adam, would you tell about yourself? Uh, I'm a data analyst with a background in finance. I work with R and Shiny to make interactive dashboards. And I started learning Clojure recently, and I'm also getting into the community and Falling in love with closure and the ecosystem. Happy to be here. Yeah, wonderful. And yeah, and I asked Adam to maybe, maybe tell us uh, in the future about Shiny, and that would be, I think, very, very much interesting to this group. Um, yeah, uh, Daniel, uh, would you like to to talk? Um, basically, I'm only curious and would like to attend as a viewer first. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hello. I, I think we, we talked earlier. So hello. And maybe uh, Daniel Shmulevich too? Again, I, uh, I didn't understood. Oh, sorry. Uh, would you like to tell anything else, Daniel? Currently, not really. I'm, I'm uh, living or I just moved from Berlin now to Saxonia and as I said, uh, I'm quite curious and would like to see what you can show. Wonderful, beautiful, thank you. And uh, Daniel Shmulevich, I think we could not hear you. Uh, oh no, no. Yeah, but we all know about you, you're so famous as well. Yeah, um, and Michael, would you like to tell us something? Uh, I've been watching the um, the invites go by for the data science and visualization related stuff for it feels like years now, and this is just the first one I've attended. Um, I want to do more in this space, but um, I haven't been able to get enough time from doing back end work to doing beautiful visualization type things. So this is exciting for me. Exciting, yeah. Thank you, and. Um... Uh, maybe I'll tell about myself. I'm Daniel as well. I do statistics mostly and a little bit of NLP. And, and 
uh, maybe Ryan, not Ryan the speaker, but the uh, Ryan, the other one, Ryan. Me? Um, uh, hi, yeah, I've just been uh, kind of following everything on Slack and Reddit. It's the first meeting I've been to, but I've watched uh, several of the meetings and I'm particularly interested in uh, these kind of, you know, more notebook kind of visualized environments and something that um, enables direct manipulation for like, so you can kind of really push and pull and tweak things and get that kind of more just like a feeling for stuff because I want to apply that stuff more to just even like CSS and more visual design and I feel like that's a crucial thing that's always been sort of elusive from the tooling. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, Christopher? Yeah, hi, I'm Chris Small here, um, living in Seattle and uh, do work with uh, Clojure and um, other data science kind of tools applying uh, applying data science towards deliberative democracy. Um, so have a have a nonprofit that uh, that does this work. And if, um, if anyone's looking to sort of apply their their closure toolkit towards some cool problems, um, kind of for the public good, then um, you know feel free to reach out to me. Um, but uh, in the closure space, um, worked on some tools that I kind of use some in my work, and uh, you know used some other kind of past projects and stuff. Um, uh, data visualization and kind of notebook environment um, uh, uh, tooling. Uh, called Oz, um, which uh, yeah, is sort of it's always a little bit hard to describe because it's a little bit of a Swiss Army knife. But um, uh, that that sort of vision is is growing and evolving, and um, yeah, really excited to see some of the the stuff that's going on today because um, there's there's uh, yeah there's just so much cool visual kind of stuff happening in the Closure community. It's um uh, it's all very inspiring. Thank you so much. Yeah, so maybe Ryan, uh, you would like uh, to tell now about yourself and just uh, talk about uh, Rabbit if you wish. Sounds good. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's great to have you guys here on this uh, beautiful Friday. Um, uh, I'm, I'm currently in Florida, um, previously in New York and the Bay Area, and just, just kind of all over, mostly East Coast guy on the US. Um, so a long time data engineer, business intelligence, um, dashboard hacker, dash jockey, you know, basically my job always consists of collect a bunch of things, answer a question and communicate that to other humans, right? I mean, that's what dashboarding was down to. So um, always been obsessed with tools that we do that. Um, uh, Ryan, you brought up the recommendation, like uh, something I'm really into because in terms of like, you know, um, how much of how much of data communication is art, you know, and how much is science? Like, there's a, there's a whole lot of mix there. So, I don't know. Let me just uh, jump into things. Sound good? So, all right. Can you guys see that? Is that too big? Too small? Maybe a bit bigger would be good. A bit bigger? Uh, I mean, a bit uh, zoomy if you could oh yeah yeah yeah. Uh, so let me uh, well actually hold on let me just uh i have it zoomed out because <laughs> i can <laughs> zoom i can zoom with the canvas so let's try oh, this okay. let's try this and if it's, if it's unreadable let me know i know yeah. i'll zoom in so Perfect. i have a i have a slide deck um it too is written in in rabbit uh but we're not going to go over it because slide decks are really boring um, this whole thing is on the website if you want to check it out. It's just a flow that reads a map and then draws um, the slide deck with some, some weird formatting. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is, so over here, I'm going to kind of go through a real example of a dashboard, you know, flow in Rabbit that uses Clojure and Clojure script blocks. Just real quick, and then we're going to go to a total blank slate, go over the interface, um, all the different features and all the panels and all the stuff that comprises like the UI, right? Um, maybe make a small dashboard in real time there um, and then go into some deeper stuff like using an external REPL. I have some other REPLs here with running like Encanter and, uh, um, uh, you know, data set ML and some other stuff, uh, which may be better for this audience. So good for this audience. So, all right. So let me just jump into my other flow here should be some of you have seen this apologies uh here we go all right so this is a small dashboard that reads from a sqlite file that is ships with the tool uh we can get rid of this guy it's basically 
um, based on Bigfoot sightings, right? It has a dashboard. And very straightforward, you know, it has a result set, it has some graphs. I can filter on, let's say I choose, you know, Kentucky, and it rewrites the SQL query, gets Kentucky, sends it to all these different blocks, re-renders it, you know, how it wants to here. Here's a, here's a little detail pane, and I click on the detail pane, I can see the story of the Bigfoot sighting in this data set. Um, you know, here's over time. Uh, another filter here, uh, different, you know, they have different classes of sightings. I don't know. That's outside the scope of this talk <laughs> um but you know i can click on a, a sighting i can click on a class it'll fill it'll add that to the sql filters or i can unclick it and it removes that from the filters and we get we get all classes all you know all states etc um so not too exciting on the dashboard front but you can see in the background um you know this is what makes it work right both blocks that it's rendering and blocks that it's not rendering there are some things that are here just for reference like you know here's here's a website of the group that you know collated this data that i that i didn't totally scrape from the website um, um ryan i'll stop you for a moment there is some please. clicking sound something uh like hissing around you I'm, i don't know what it is but maybe something on the table i'm not sure so uh, just if you know it is not much of a trouble but maybe uh, if you know what it is, then uh, yeah. I, I, apologies, it's, it's the dog left the room. Oh, perfect. He might, he oh, yeah. And so, I'm sorry. If it becomes a big problem, I can lock them out. No, it is not. It is not. Yeah, sorry for that. Yeah, <laughs> I was hoping that it would get canceled out with the Zoom stuff, but uh, sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. So, so basically, like I said, this is a dashboard. This is all its parts. Um, this is, you know, this code of each. I'm going to go deeper into this in a second, but just as an overview, you know. Uh, the code of each of these blocks, you know, for, like, for example, if I select this query, I can see that it 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 in it takes in a JDBC connection, some parameters, and it spits out its data to all these different other blocks, right? Which then draw a graph, et cetera. It's kind of like that spatial way of looking at things. So, so, so I guess after that intro, you know, so so what is Rabbit, right? Um, so this is a closure group. So I, I guess I can pretty much say, think of it as like a, a like an interconnected whiteboard of data focused REPLs, right? Um, local first, you know, canvas based, uh, you know, spatially oriented, what I call it, flow based. So I can either use atoms or say, hey, render, uh, render or process, evaluate this. And then I'm gonna send that to this other arbitrary thing. It doesn't need to know anything about the first block, right? in that kind of like, you know, 1970s flow-based programming kind of way. But atoms, which we all know and love, you know, operate the same way because it's the same concept, basically. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and visual composition, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, something that I want to say is it's, it's also a true REPL, right? There's the bootstrap closure script, and then there's the closure REPLs. Um, there's not a whole lot of, I mean, there's some sugary stuff here, obviously, with the UI, but I wanted to make sure that at the base level of all these things is always just closure code, like no like magic rabbit functions that does this and that, because that's kind of what I was trying to get away from, right? Like my whole career came up in like data viz tools, ones I built myself, and then things like, you know, SQL Server reporting services and Tableau and like Click View and like Micro Tragedy, and, like all, all these things. And they let you do a lot of cool stuff, but you're always limited by this like glass ceiling of what they've allowed you to do in their proprietary environment. And I always kind of wanted, um, especially after seeing some of the Brett Victor stuff years ago, I always wanted a tool that allowed me to do that kind of thing, but generate code that I can then fork and do other stuff with, right? And don't box me into your proprietary like windows. So it's kind of like, it's kind of ironic that I started this whole thing off wanting to make kind of a superset like you know meta base like drag and drop dashboard builder you know the dashboard builder of my dream so to speak but as i did i did the idea over and over again i needed so much flexibility and customization that eventually turned into a full-blown like basically an ide right wearing the skin of a data tool or vice versa um so if that if that makes any sense right um so yeah, so let's go, let's go into this interface. So we've seen some stuff. I'm sure everyone's confused. Totally makes sense. Let's go to, I'll go to a browser here. I will just go to, we'll just go to a blank flow. Okay. 
So, so here is, is the canvas, right? You know, I have, I'm using, uh, and, and there's the, there's docs on this, the website, you know, I'm using space to like zoom into the canvas, zoom out. I can turn panels on and off. Um, this is my palette. This is a list of blocks that exists. We have none. Um, there's no editor because there's no, there's no blocks here. So let me start off and say, okay, let me drag in a closure script block. All right. So we'll bring this in here, one data block. All right, great. So you can see hot and closure script 110, 879. All right. I open this guy. Now I open the editor. So the editor is where most of the cool stuff happens, right? So uh, on first glance, pretty straightforward, right? You have a, um, you know, a little a code mirror instance here and we can type stuff, you know, and it evaluates and that's all good. But the interesting thing about this is that it's kind of configurable. So I can say, maybe I want this view. Yep. Maybe zoom in a little bit if you could. Uh, for the code for the editor you sure yeah thanks um, so let me actually zoom in and then refresh it because it's gonna it's gonna confuse the whole xy position system okay right, so go back to the flow and you Is this a little better? Yes, thank you. So with, with the editor, we have you know your, your text input, you have your output, um, but you see it says out auto. So what happens is when when anything gets evaluated, it could be a data structure, it could be um, it could be hiccup, it could be a visualization. Um, it gets evaluated and it gets looked at. What is this? And how can I display it? So in this case, it's a string. So the out auto is essentially this fancy little, you know, this is a string, but I could also say, show it as text, you know, I can't show it as a map or anything else, but, you know, kind of like, I want to see the same thing as many ways as possible, you know, I want to, so in addition to having the spatial layout of things, I want to be able to see all my blocks and understand them on their own, you know, chord. So, you know, this can be auto, this could be, this can be text. Um, I can go to, let's do some other data types here. We'll go to this screen. So, Again, a string. Here we have uh, a vector, and you can see it, it, it draws it in a, in a nice little map box here. You know, again, it could could be text uh, or it's auto. Um, you see, I'm displaying it in the editor and also displaying it on the canvas. I could also say, "Hey, on the canvas, show the text," and it shows the text there. It's just whatever you need to to visualize. You know, you should be able to do that. Um, here is a vector of maps of uniform maps. You know, which. I use a lot in doing visits and stuff and coming out of SQL. Um, so it gets visualized as like a V table, you know, uh, like a row, like a grid. Um, it could also be, you know, text. It could also be, let's pretend it's a map. And then it looks like a vector of maps, except in this non, you know, this non grid style. And, and you notice how the colors is there are different. Um, I try to keep it very consistent, right? Vectors are blue, strings are yellow. Um, row sets, you know, row sets are, are green and you'll see that all through the app, you know, whether it's from pulling a block to another block or the outline of the block itself. So like I try to keep the data types really consistent because, you know, while closure is a dynamic language, you know, it's super important when I'm having stuff coming in and out of my block that I know what it is without having to like look at it too hard, you know, so that, that kind of helps, you know, here's, here's a flow, nothing too exciting. Um, integer. This is a map. Um, I can make the map as bizarre as I want. And, you know, I have this like recursive map viewer here, which should show it, or, you know, you can always just see the text if you want, but, you know, the, uh, this is important because so much of what we do deals with, you know, uh, pulling apart maps and looking at maps and trying to like dissect them. And, uh, while this kind of view may look strange at, at first, it's, it's actually, uh, as I'll get to a second, it's, it's super helpful again. So here's a, here's a hiccup. Um, you know, and it says, oh, this is, this is hiccup. So I'm going to run this as a render object. And then, you know, there it is. And it's just an image from, you know, online Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, but you know, that's the, that's the kind of idea, right? Write whatever code you want. We'll figure out what it is and we'll try to show it to you in as many ways as possible. Right. So back to the map. So now we get into some like tricky kind of stuff. Right. So I mentioned earlier, direct manipulation and code 
starters, like helping me down my path, right? Help me get where I want to go, but don't force me to do it the way you want to, right? So this is a map, you know, we deal with tons of maps, a really common thing is I'd be like, oh, okay, so I want to do this. Uh, let's do a get in and do blah, blah, blah. Well, that happens so often, right? If I really want this, this key, this TT key, I don't really care how, how deep it's nested. I want to say, well, just give me, you know, just give me this key. And I just drag it out there and it generates a get in, you know, M4, TT, whatever the arbitrary depth is. And I want this, go to there. And again, you know, it's nothing super fancy. You could totally do that, you know, with, with a get in. But when you're trying to like keep that feedback loop going of flow, of building your thing, I think it's it's so nice to just be able to say, hey, oh, what is this? Oh, what is this? This MM? What is that? Oh, what is this number two? Like, let's let's look at this. Like, okay, maybe I want that. And maybe I'm just going to get rid of this. And you know what I mean? Like, just kind of like keep, keep flowing with what I'm doing. Um, and this will lead to other things. And as you can see here, we have, you know, we're doing our get in from parameter. You can see the input is that original map and the output is, you know, what I'm doing. If I were to drag this out, it sends itself by default because it doesn't know anything else. And then now I'm looking at, you know, output, input, and you see the, the hover highlighting, just trying to make sure that when you're looking at a piece of code, you always have the context surrounding it. Um, just whatever you need to do to get, to get the job done, right? So more, uh, oh, I should have mentioned about the panels. So <laughs> these, so editor panel, preview panel. So I, I grew up, uh, you know, I've been playing PC games for a long, long time, you know, since they were really kind of a thing. And uh, my left hand is always on, and let me know if anyone else is like this. My left hand, no matter what I'm doing, is almost always on WASD and shift and space bar. Right, it's like it's like I'm playing Quake all the time. Um, so I have, I can just turn on and off all these panels doing it that way. You know, I can I can zoom in, I can do this. I, I it's kind of like you know a keyboard mouse kind of thing. It might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I find it so nice to be able to like switch on the interface. It's like I'm using, it's like uh, you know Quake Quake plus Emacs. I don't know. Uh, anyways, that's that's down here. You can see when I hover over, you know, Shift W, Shift S, Shift A. Um, Anyway, so would, as an aside, would those be configurable for say a Vim user? Not right now, but I totally want that to be a thing, right? Yeah, okay, cool. People have their own, uh, you know, yeah, like we have our own, yeah, yeah, <laughs> muscle and, memory, <laughs> evil, evil mode, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah <laughs> maybe I yeah. should, maybe a muscle memory should be more editor and less, uh, and less doom and quake, but yeah, I'm totally with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we so, all spend our time where we spend it, <laughs> very, very true, <laughs> for better or worse. So, so we have some maps here and that's cool. And that's, uh, you know, nothing too super exciting. So here we have um, just a vector, you know, a range of strings, right? Uh, again, nothing too epic, but here we get into like some, I, I want to do as much direct manipulation as I can where it makes sense, you know, because it's, it's hard because like the tool is made to just process arbitrary code. So it, it's difficult to be like, well, I can build a special this way. So, by default, it can it can modify uh, pixel values, you know, big CSS thing, numbers, integers. So I could say, okay, here's range eight. You know, I can just highlight that eight and say, well, it's an integer, so you know, let's just scrub eight and just see what feels right. You know, like right, maybe it should be, you know, maybe it should be a six. Okay, that's and I can change the max values here. Um, and as you can see, kind of like cheeky. As I'm scrubbing it, you can see underneath it replaces it with an internal atom and then gets rid of it for the actual value. So cheating, but I'm cheating in a very closure way, right? So, you know, that's kind of scrubbing. I can also highlight anything and right click to evaluate it, kind of like light table. So I right click on range seven, like I can say, oh shit, it's, it's a list of seven things. Like that, that's awesome. Um, and that's not limited, you know, I can highlight this whole thing and right click and it gives me the same output as this would because it's just evaluating that snippet. You know, maybe if I look at this string, it shows me yo. It doesn't know what I. It doesn't know what I is, but that's that's all well and good. And this may seem this may seem like kind of kind of silly, but you'd be surprised at how nice this kind of thing is for doing data viz or tweaking certain things and just being like, I just want to change that. I don't want to. I don't want to have to type with my left hand. I just want to like do something with my right hand. Um, it, it gets it gets really handy, and we can get even more complicated there. Well, let me just paste in like an extension of that. So this is basically the same thing, except, oh, sorry, the, the big the big font is making it making it a little big. This is basically the same thing, except I'm I'm doing the vector and I'm making a uh, um, flex box flex boxes with recon right, and then putting that in a vertical box. Um, 
you know, same same kind of thing. In this case, I'm doing a range 12. You know, I could say, you know, let's do, you know range eight. Um, the padding, maybe I wanted the padding to be a little more or a little less. You know, I just kind of like figure out what I want. Um, you know, what what color are these boxes? Maybe that pink's a little, you know, bad. I can go over here and choose this stuff. You know, the very common things we change doing like CSS maps and stuff, all of the stuff that I build all the time, I wanted to make it easy to just change, right? Um, so not only that, but I'm using, an, I'm using an atom here, right? So I click, you see, as I click, it changed that, that from nil to an integer. That's because the output, oh, I should have changed this before. So the output is actually this atom. So normally, the output of a block would be itself, right? So I drag this out and I get myself. And it, it's notice it's not it's not reevaluating this. It's actually just sending over the the precompiled um, closure script and just running it. Uh, but anyway, so so I have my atom here and I'm, I'm clicking on things and changing that atom. I can open up this panel and it sees that I'm using that I'm derefing or I, that I defined an atom in this in this block. So it allows it as part of my editor. So I can say, all right, let me change to this flow. Let me change to this layout, right? On well, my code here, I want to output my, I want my output here. And let's just put this atom in this box, right? So now as I'm working on my block, you know, I have access to that atom and I can see it down there in the corner. And, and that's, you know, super, super helpful, right? It can read it right from, right from this namespace. So where this gets interesting is that remember I said when I when I send out a block it sends itself because generally blocks are you know looking for data structures or or the viz is like the end result of data structures. Well in this case we're mutating an atom and like maybe this is important this is what I want. You know let's say this is some kind of pick list. I can say all right well instead of sending out yourself I can grab this atom here that showed up in the second list say well send this atom as the output so now when I drag the block out, it should be, you know, so it's three. So now as I click on it, you know, it changes, it changes, it changes the atom and they all, they all update. So now I'm downstreaming things from a little UI thing that I created just based on a little atom. And this is how, you know, you sliders would work or color pickers would work. And uh, this is a contrived example for sure. But I think you can kind of see like where I'm going with this when you put all these things together. So, um, any questions on that so far? It's a lot of stuff. Huh? Cool. All right. So, I did the scrubbing. Oh yeah. Also, with the um, the scrubbing I was talking about, it's also configurable on the user side, right? So if I have um, um. Right. If I if I have some type of key pairing, remember I said I can use pixel values, I can do floats, integers, true, false, very simple things the scrubber can do. But I can also do completely arbitrary things. So if I want to go into the settings here and say key value pair, this, so this is literally where if it's not a base value, this is where it reads from to get its values. So if I want to say, um, you know, veggies can be, you know, this, you know, that, I don't that, you know, you know, whatever, right? And I run that, then I should be able to, if I highlight the key pair, it should be like, oh, okay, this is a veggie. This is the veggie key. And the veggie key can be these things. Again, fairly contrived, but you'd be surprised that doing like working on different biz libraries and different things. I have some stuff in there for, for Nevo and some Vegas stuff, but just work, working on different things. It, it's amazing how, how nice something really small like that is, right? So configurable scrubber, uh, number scrubber, you get all that. Uh, yeah, Sorry, I, I know I can just play this back, but where'd you where'd you put that again? Where where'd you oh. add the those options? Yeah, there's a, so down here a little gear. Settings, so there's, a, okay. there's a settings okay. panel. You can also again the, the quake leak and three hit. You can hit tilde and bring up the settings also. Um, and you know I, I have some couple things here that I might that I might get to. Um, but yeah, basically this is this is the the base map it uses for like arbitrary scrubbers. And it, essentially it just ends up being like uh, vectors, you know, of things. Um, uh, I think especially useful if like, you know, there's a certain thing that needs like a color scheme and I can just put all the color schemes in here and just like pick one or yeah, fonts yeah. are a big one. Like I don't want to type that all the time. Um, yeah. Anything that saves time, right? And it's not like a, yeah. a kludge. Um, so, so this is, 
if, if, if this is not the right time for this, but we, uh, this question, no, go right ahead. Right, but um, I, I'm really interested in like, like, have you messed with taking aspects of like Vega specifications, say, and kind of like mapping them into this so that you could um, almost without doing any work, start messing with, um, uh, you know, building composers for, um, you know, kind of explorer views where you're able to construct the or, or tinker with the graphs. Um, I mean, I, I see that there's already some kind of baked like directionality in that here in the way that you can like turn things into atoms like pretty pretty <laughs> easily and, um, and and do things that way. But um, but yeah, as far as um, as far as like what's the what's the vision for like the the plug of, like I I don't know if you're gonna build in this stuff <laughs> kind of uh, uh, um, for for stuff like Vega uh, as sort of part of the base package. But what would it look like to sort of um, extend that so that, you know, if you are using something like Vega or let's forget Vega, let's say some other, you know, um, visualization toolkit that has its own sets of options. Like what's the, do you see, do you see like a pathway for plugging those things in as little kind of extension kits? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Vega is a great one because, uh, so if you think about it, would the, the scrubber like looks for common patterns, understands, right. And can fill in the, the gaps. Right. So the Vega scheme is kind of similar. I, I could definitely see, um, like some type of builder that just spits out that's because you're you're not like hiding anything you're spitting out what is the Vega light you know construct or the code and it's getting rendered so yeah I can totally that's the next thing so that's on my radar um, and also um, I want to have something that makes it easy to read in like open open API schemas and do calls to the web from the closure REPL or just say hey yeah. I pick this thing and then it generates the, the you know generates the call and then I'm like great I can just keep moving you know with my 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 yeah. process without having to be like oh yeah. what is this um you know, if, you, if you're thinking mm -hmm. about that one one thing you might look at is actually just whether um whether it would make sense to read directly um the json spec um mm -hmm. specifications um because everything in vega and vega light is um is in a json spec and that would enable you to like if you could ingest that and do as much you know kind of intelligent stuff as you could with it um I, then yeah i think you'd be like 90 percent of the way there um yeah, for yeah, sure. And I think I, I, I think I, I sent you some like some nonsensical stuff about layers the other day. Um, yeah, I'm totally thinking about I'm almost thinking about having I don't know. I, I don't know how I do it. I don't know whether it would be a block type or just a hey, like 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 clippy. Like, hey, it looks like you're trying to write a Vega. Like, let's mm -hmm. let's go to Vega Studio. You know, what I mean, something like mm -hmm. that would be really cool. And I don't feel like it's cheating because I was, if I'm generating the code that you can then fork. Right. I'm not locking you into like some box. Right. Um, which is what I tried to do all this kind of stuff. But yeah, I'm, I'm 100% with you. Uh, so on that note, talking about metadata and building stuff, let's do uh, like a real kind of thing here. Um, I just had a quick question about the scrubbers. Um, is that something you could uh, extend or modify if you want a different kind of user interface or visualization or some kind of picker convenience or something? Uh, yeah. Those? I'm trying to figure out uh, the best way to do that. So obviously with this, you know, this is super simple, just, you know, data based, but I would love to have, so I, I'd like to keep the changes user space if I can, like, I would love to have a, a certain flow that has all your functions in it. And then you come here and say, Hey, if uh, he selects a, I don't know, a dumb example, like an HSL color, right? I don't support that right now, just hex colors. Like then, hey, then run this function and set this because you're just using closure. You're not using like any esoteric thing. So I could theoretically say, hey, as long as it was like namespaced right, it would totally work because it would render in my little modal box and you'd be kind of off. And then you could have flows that have like completely esoteric kind of components, right? That other ones don't have and share them back and forth. And um, if we get to it, there's a cool thing I, I can do with, I'm doing with um, subflows, right? Have a flow that does something and then import that flow into another flow, except use it as like an application, um, which is a little not what you're talking about, but kind of share some ideas, right? Um, but yeah, I want to do as much direct motivation stuff as I can. So uh, for sure, uh, it's something I'm looking into. Uh, so on that same note, let's do something a little more interesting. So like I said, I'm a, I'm a dashboard guy for a long time, and uh, I do use a lot of SQL. I do a lot of like arbitrary biz stuff. So it's important to me to have like quick answers, like doing select alls and little pivots. Like, you know, not that I can't write that myself, but like, especially if you're feeling something out, I mean, you can imagine looking at a new data set and having a canvas completely full of like arbitrary SQL queries and group buys. You're just trying to understand the data. You're trying to like look into it and like figure out what's there. 
So if I drag in a server block, so this is a closure block, uh, say you're running 110, and this little, you know, hello world box here, like we saw, and I paste in a JDBC connection. So this is from a ClickHouse server running on my local machine, and it sees it's a JDBC connection, it tries to connect to it, and if it can, it pulls the metadata. So it has metadata, cool, that's not too exciting, right? But what I can also do is render that metadata in like a useful way. So you see, we have different little pills here. We have, now we have a new one, have out JDBC. Let me drag that one to the canvas renderer. So now I have the table list on the canvas renderer and I can kind of see it in that more, you know, a way we've kind of be used to. So in this case, we can hide you. Um, I care about this UFO data table I have. So if I search for UFO, I think it's called USA. There you go. So here you have, this is the table. Okay, seems good. And now I just say, hey, let me look at this. I can drag this out to the canvas and it does a select all for me. So this seems kind of like magical and weird, but it's not. I mean, this box is a JDBC connection and it's pushing itself to this box, which is a SQL query and ingesting this connection. But it has this little simple SQL builder because, you know, the things we do in SQL are all very similar. So let's say, let's go to, where's year? So I want year in a group by, and I want to get rid of all, and I grab in count one. And now we have counts by year, cool. Maybe that's what I wanted. Uh, let's go to 100. Let me go back here and uh, make this guy a little more, you know, slim and tasteful since we did the, uh, we did the thing. Okay, now I have now I have year and count, and that's 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 cool. You know, um, let me get rid of this since we don't need it right now. Like, all right, well, maybe this is what I want, maybe not. Let's take it a step further. So I can click on these rows, and that's kind of important because by clicking on a row, I'm telling the interface like, hey, look at this particular map, right? So if I click on this 2000, you can see even the SQL generator changes to like year 2000. You, you know, so. I could drag this into where, and it would know that, you know, only show me things are a year or 2000, but we're not gonna do that, but just show you how the clicking thing works. So we have this panel called clicked row. It was like, okay, let's, let's do things with these rows. Again, I click on a row to give it the context. These are single, so single op. So I could say year, well, this SQL query is already run, right? So this is already in closure script, this data set. So maybe we want to sum all those values up, right? Or maybe we wanna, you know, get an average of the counts by year. Uh, like just little silly things that you might not actually do, but it's nice to like kind of have them there. And you know, that the code is nothing special. Uh, my idea is to, to start you down the path you want to go, not necessarily write the best, most beautiful, awesome code. Um, you know, I, I can create a distinct vector of the years if that's something that I need to do. So I have my SQL query, you know, here's, here's my, my years. And then obviously if I were to change this query, where is my guy here? Let's just do the year thing. You know, I change my query and everything downstream changes because that's just how Rabbit works. It's, you know, uh, you know, upstream, downstream, if anything changes, tell all its children re-render based on the new information. But we're not going to do that, but just as an example. So let's get rid of these examples, counts and averages and distincts. Um, do something a little more interesting. So we'll go back to click row. I'll click a row. Oh, you can also re-aggregate, right? So if I had two dimensions here and I wanted to say, you know, re-aggregate this by only one dimension, um, you could do that, but in this case, I'm, I'm going to skip that. So the only Viz library I have implemented right now is Nevo, but Vega Lite with, with Oz is coming very soon. Um, so very simple, here's by year, it's the count. Um, I want year, I want count, year is my X, count is my Y. Again, nothing groundbreaking here, but I just want to be able to answer things, oh, that I accidentally drag in a uh, line. Um, I just want to be able to answer things as I think of them, right? Um, whether it's the most beautiful thing or not, like, let me get to a place where I can understand what it is I'm building and then build it. So here you can see there's a lot of values. It's kind of smushed. Um, maybe I want it to be vertical. Again, with a scrubber, layout vertical, I can just say, well, layout, you know, horizontal. Meh, that's not too great either. But let's see, uh, you know, the margins on the left, you know, we want to bring them out a little bit so I can see something. Um, again, all the kind of, uh, you know, the, the colors and the, the scrubbing. I'm just kind of like building, building stuff here. Um, let us make this a little bigger. 
that's kind of that's kind of so let's do let's do something else here let us do i mean dragon sightings us again this is going somewhere i swear um so let us say let's do state we'll do by state we'll say count we'll get rid of that and we'll do the same thing we did before click row no i want state by count um and i want that bar cool we're going to make this one horizontal as well and actually what i should have done is i should have said uh sort cool uh Just two. Oh, so I pivoted it. Crap. All right. Anyways, I don't want to. I don't want to fuck with that too much while we're on the line here. So let's just say this is the bar I want. Hypothetically, you know, we have we got states. You know, we got counts. Uh, let me turn on again the big big uh, big fonts or screen up here. All right. All right. We're gonna turn on labels and. Let me just get rid of you. We don't need to see you as well. Where is the label? Yeah, so label, we can make that a little, a little smaller there. This really fits. Cool. All right, so what is a big thing you end up doing in these like, you know, explorations? Is we want to filter stuff. So by default, um, clicking on a bar generates a map, um, outputting the values and some other things, um, which we can use in our, in our flow. So I drag the output. So the output of this gendered of this or rendered bar is always its own atom. So this is like a custom thing that gets built um, as opposed to like a generic block outputs itself. So it outputs, you know, this this map, the color. Whatever. But what we really care about is this, right? So data, state, string, Texas. Okay. So that's kind of what I want to screw with. So let me uh, go in here. Let me drag out state. I would normally do like a get in here, obviously, but since this is a demo, we'll, we'll do auto by dragging and dropping. All right, cool. So I want I want this value, but first I need to tell the value. I need to tell SQL what this actually is, right? So is it state name? No, it's just called state. So I make this a I make this a map called state, and I don't always want to send it because if I if I unclick, it becomes nil, and I don't want that because that that kind of assumes that I'm sending a null value, and I I don't want that. So let's just do real quick uh, when um, that should just work for the sake of brevity. Yeah, I could do a not nil there, but this this actually works fine too. Okay, so now we have our little map fragment again. Sorry, dogs. Um, and clicking on this downstreams that value. Okay, great. Let me get another query. So this is Bigfoot Sightings US again. Bring it out here. Does it select all? I'm going to drag this into the parameters of this generated query. And by default, it should see that and say, so yeah, so I have it open here. I can go to this bar and say, you know, show me this. And it should send in, yeah, state, Washington, unselect state, everybody, state, California. Okay, cool. So now we're, we're making some stuff happen, right? I didn't really type too much code. I'm just kind of like, I'm just kind of screwing around the data. Awesome. So now we got that working. So now I can say, all right, well, now I have this data set. Let's look at um, where is so UFO shape. And then we'll look at the count there and get rid of that. And now we have another, another group by do throw here and actually let's do let's do one more one more dimension there let's do by by day or night too cool two dimensions one value all right spring clicked row back and let's say let's click on a row so i want i want count to be the sum shape to be let's say the color it's not really a color because this i'm going to make a heat map which it's just is basically like the pivot um and this is going to be x so let me drag that out to here and that's uh, a little busy, but kind of. There's a lot of more shapes than I thought. Um, but okay, that's that's kind of that's kind of cool, right? So we have day by day by night and all the different 
sighting shapes, I guess. Um, and of course, it's a child of this block here. So by clicking on, you know, various bars, it will downstream the SQL query and everything, everything below it. Um, I could also from the, the SQL query do, you know, cheat and be like, well, we've already done the query. So I'm just going to say, hey, just sum up all these numbers over here also. So then we have, you know, 8906, and it should change to, you know, 65,000 for everything, uh, 8906. So I could have put these things closer together. But you, you kind of you see where, where I'm kind of going here. So uh, let's do one more thing with this. So now we have this, uh, this state data. Um, let us do one more over here. This is going to be by state, but I'm going to use the state code so I can draw a map. So we're going to throw the count in, cool, 65,000. Uh, we'll do FIP state code. And yeah, that should be good for now. Drag the sky, make the sky a little smaller. Uh, and I know that I drew a Vega map for the US not too long ago, so I can look for it here. I can open up the browser and, you know, these are all the blocks in the, the flow set I have opened, even ones that I haven't looked at yet. So, you know, maybe I look, I look for Vega like that. That's not the one I want. Um, map or some of those. So I can also say, let's look at the code of these blocks. So like what I'm just looking for, like Vega light. Okay, these are the blocks that have Vega light. And if I hover over, I can see, yeah, line five, you know, using odds, Vega light, line four, you know, this is, uh, you know, me trying to figure out legends. <laughs> um, okay, so here we have Bigfoot US States. I think that's the one I want. So let me just, just drag that guy in here. So it's gonna pull it from the, you know, from whatever flow it existed in and send it to me. Um, obviously it's not gonna render because it doesn't have the data that it that it needed in the other flow. Um, but I can, you know, I, I'm pretty aware of what, it, of what it needs. So I can say, all right, we have count one here and oops, let me just get rid of that guy. Uh, I can bring this in and since I thought about this earlier, I'm just gonna paste in changes instead of like you watching me fumble with the editor and field names. This should be the right count one and FIP state code. And then let's rerun this to make sure it propagates. Okay, sweet. It doesn't have all of them because I didn't have enough, uh, not enough states in that, that call. Okay, cool. So it's a little piece of Vega, I'm passing it something. And I can also say, hey, why don't you also take in my filter from before? So now this one filter is pushing, you know, two SQL queries from this viz. So I, I'm gonna go back here and make sure that it's, uh, and, and the code for this is not, is not, I mean, it's kind of goofy because I'm, you know, I'm taking, I'm taking the incoming map and making it a where clause. You know, you wouldn't want to do this in production, but the whole point is to like move you forward in your thought process, not exactly make the best thing, but let's get you to a place where you can then go back and fiddle and tweak and do whatever you want to. So this is just very naive, right? But like you see, you know, with, with uh, California there, it, it gets us somewhere where we're building like a meaningful thing, right? So cool. So we've got all this downstream stuff happening. What do we do with it, right? I can see, Ryan, you've got this big graph here, all this stuff going on. You know, we've got like this whole thing going, well, I need to show this to somebody. And like my boss is not gonna, he's gonna be like, what, what you know, what is this, right? All right, so we got to show this to somebody. So this is where we get into composing stuff. So I'm going to drag in a view composer, which is pretty much what you think it would be, but it's kind of like what you would do if you were building this yourself, right? You create all your functions for all your different blocks, and then you have a, another one that had the, you know, what are the hiccup layout or recon or whatever. So this is a composer, and there's no code here. Well, except for CSS, all it wants to do is show other things. So I didn't give these blocks good names. So excuse me if I'm, I'm gonna have a problem finding them, but okay. So this, we want the heat map for sure. We want, uh, those are just data sets. We want the bar, cause that's important. And, and that's the data set. Well, we can put the data set in, that's cool. There's our states. And I think that's it. So you can see, I don't know if this will fit. You know, by default, it, uh, uh, let me, well, you know, we got, we got fit problems, so that's all right. So by default, it says, you know, hey, okay, cool. I'm gonna put this in the container. You know, horizontal, vertical is kind of by default. 
which is which is cool. Like that's you know I have no I have no problem with that. But a lot of my layouts I, I kind of just do in a, like a free form way. Like I might have a block like this that has four things, and then I'll take this block and put it in another block, right? But in this case, let's just say, all right, well, we want this whole thing to be floating. So if I click on the heat map, you know, I can, you know, drag it down here, uh, you know, make it big. I'm going to pause the rendering for a second just so it doesn't pause as much. And let's put, you know, the states over here. And where's my, is this my selector bar? Uh, yes. Okay. So, um, well, whatever. You get the idea. So now we have all that stuff that operates under the same that operates under the same logic rules of this flow, but is shown. Let me unselect that guy. Let me unselect you, and we turn off the edges. Sweet. So yeah, so it operates the way it should before, except in this composed view, right? So if I'm presenting something, you know, this would be uh, my dashboard, but people still have access to all the underlying, you know, uh, mechanics of the dashboard. So if this were my thing, let me turn this off. And if I wanted to start, see, you know, let me, let me just give it a name. So, you know, my, uh, whatever, uh, my great thing. And then if I were to star that, and I was in the little file browser, you could see where are we? What is the flow we got open? We got more welcome. So, oh, I got to save it. Silly. So it's saving it as a flat EDN file on my machine. You know, this is all local host first stuff um, with all this metadata. And then now you should be able to see oh, my great thing. So if I was showing my uh, boss or something, you know, they would be able to they would be able to navigate this whole flow based on the flows and the dashboards, and this is what would would come up. Now, before someone says it, yes, there's some double rendering going on in the graph here, and um, we can mitigate that by just minimizing these things um, or keep them open. Um, sometimes I think there's value in seeing you know how everything works. One of the things I got really frustrated with with things like Tableau was that you can do so much complicated things in the calculations that then become incredibly opaque to the next person who looks at it, right? Like, I don't know what he was doing, how this works. They basically have to go into all those different things. And Tableau is a very user-friendly tool, but when it comes to some stuff, the person has to go in and like under this like lossy compression, like unpack all that is that I did, um, where if they had like a literal roadmap of what it was laid out in a kind of a fairly straightforward manner, it'd be much easier to grok like what the hell is going on what queries uh, affect what things, you know, where I'm hacking things, where I'm not. Um, so I think that, because someone was like, well, my boss doesn't care about the, the dashboard. Like you're, you're probably, or doesn't care about the graph. You're probably right. But I think more people should care about kind of what went into making something. It's so easy to lie and hide stuff with data. Um, so that's my soapbox speech. But yeah, you can minimize this stuff and uh, it works for the, it works fine but at the same point you know some things need to be rendered in order to react right so i'm kind of working on the minimize thing but uh definitely definitely a thought um but yeah this is an ugly dashboard but i'm pretty sure you get the you get the drift there um so daniel i don't know if i if i can go like five more minutes and show some like REPL stuff if people aren't totally bored yet yeah that would be great i think okay cool because this is a lot of closure strip stuff and i want to do something that touched more on like more like closure -y things. Um, so I mentioned okay, earlier. Uh, yeah, quick yeah. question about the, um, the, the composer block. Uh, that's, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, again, is that something that would be like, if you had an idea for some, like some composer with like specific constraints or something baked in, is that extendable or can you create your own blocks like that? Or um, It's not extendable right now, but I can, what I can do is, I don't know if this is like probably not what you're talking about, if, but if I do, um, Something I've been doing to other dashboards is to keep things, um, well, maybe you can, because if I get to the subflow stuff later, sorry, I'm not thinking out loud. Uh, you can do things like, here's my composer, and let's just like, you know, drag some crap in here, and let's make it, uh, what is that? All right, let's make it vertical, well, horizontal, whatever. Um, and then, what do I call that again? View composer 508, 
you know, I can then come here and say, well, um, where is it? You know, I can I can nest these things together and it recursively render all that stuff, which kind of which makes you kind of um, have things that are not completely. Again, it doesn't really answer your question, but it is it, it can be interesting. You know, um, something that I didn't mention is that the editor panel where you type in the code is also a valid render. So I could have a, a page that has literal SQL box or a code box then has its output next to it. And you can do all kinds of like weird stuff um, with that. But if I get to the subflow thing, that, that might answer your question. So sorry, sorry, Ryan, I'm answering like the sideways adjacent question. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, I, it, I just, I don't know, it's kind of maybe related. It's uh, somewhat tangential, but um, it seemed like, yeah, when you're doing, doing like when you're scrubbing like a linear, uh, you know, number value, you get pretty smooth animated like stream and mutations on the results, um, at least in closure script. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if that's also, if that's true or if there's any sort of gotchas to that, like to, to see, to get that kind of, you know, more fine grain push and pull um, mm -hmm. versus maybe it depends on how complex the flow is. Also, if with closure, like if you were doing the in and out of closure script and closure, do you get more of a sort of stop and start, uh, you know, refresh compared to like a you know, like a smooth kind of uh, scrub? Yeah. So the, a lot of the examples I use are, are closure script things that are fairly even the bar chart. I mean, it's not a whole lot of rows there. So you're going to be limited to how often the browser can actually refresh that. Um, there's no debouncing or anything right now. Um, there probably should be because some things, you know, like I said, some things are more expensive than others. Um, so something I'll show at the very end, it's a canvas drawing, and that kind of has a little bit of that lagginess um, as the browser, especially like if it's scaled up or you have, like I, I do videos in 4K and sometimes it's like the browser's like, oh, come on, yeah, it's Chrome is very sensitive. But but yeah, so this is an example kind of what you're talking about. So this is, um, I mentioned earlier that it can connect to external REPLs. So I have these two other REPLs running on my other monitor here. One that connects to, um, you know, data set ML libraries. Another one that is um, Encanter with an older version of Clojure. So if I go to this Encanter text box, oh, it's huge. Um, ignore, ignore some of the byte array stuff. I was worried about saving files outside of the web route. So I was like doing like base 64 byte code. But anyway, so this is a connecting to a custom REPL I have at port 42999 over here. In fact, if I, if, I, if I use this string, this is like a comment hint to say what REPL to use. If I drag out a um, another server block, so the built-in server, right, is, you know, 110.3. And if I drag in another one and uh, I open that guy up and I say, same code, but I just say, hey, use this REPL instead, you can see it changes to closure 1.9, right? So it's a totally different, it's a totally different uh, uh, evaluation environment. So for Encanter, I kind of have to do that, right? Because I couldn't get it to work with the newer ones. And I guess it works for them, I guess. So, so here we have super simple from the readme, right? Uh, a sine wave and like a randomized like histogram. But what's cool about this is that I have these, I have these closure script sliders. And let me make this guy small again. And they're just using atoms. They're, they're right here on the CLJS side. But what's cool about them is they're they're sending their values into that other REPL, right? So it's definitely not gonna be as fast as closure script, but as it as it injects the values in, it gets reevaluated and you can kind of see, you know, so I, I have closure script, you know, you kind of like talking back, you know, crossing the streams of, of a completely arbitrary closure environment. Um, so again, that's, that's, yeah, that still looks pretty fast considering it's kind of going over the wire and stuff, that's neat. Yeah, I mean, probably because it's like the simple to render. If I was actually pushing PNGs, it might be faster and I'm doing the byte in the base 64 encoding. But you know, and when you're when you're picking stuff, you're it's probably okay to wait. I can imagine drop down something. Again, a stupid example, but I mean, you guys would probably be more into this stuff, you know, than I have been in terms of like the like ML data set and like the silage. Um, as another example, here is another, this is connected to a different REPL that is doing the Titanic example from the GitHub. Um, what is this error here? 
Is it because it's trend? Hmm. So let's, uh, uh, this is just a shell output. Let me take a second there. Oh, oh no. So the curse of the demo. What this was, was a, actually, is it connecting the right port? I'm just, re I'm just restarting the REPL. Uh, oh. Oh, okay, weird. So now it's running for the first time, so I think it has to build the models for that particular library. So... Is that the is that the main way to bring external code into a canvas is through like additional REPLs or? Yeah, I mean, there's a built in REPL, but doesn't have these libraries loaded, right? So, uh, okay, cool. So after it loads its initial deal. All right, so here we have, so I can look at, so it's a little different than a closure box, right? Because I can look at the REPL, I can look at the REPL output, like what you would see printed, right? If you're at a, like a regular REPL, uh, but I can also use, data sets that come out of that. So you can see there's out one, two, three, or zero, one, two. Um, unlike closure, closure script, which closure script acts more like a do block, right? You can do a bunch of stuff. And then last thing it's outputted because generally you're trying to render something, right? Or do one thing. But in a REPL, like I can have all kinds of stuff going on. So in this case, um, I'm not only printing some of these outputs, but I am sending them through MapSeq Reader also. So here's the output, you know, this is like from the README on the GitHub page, um, you know, all the survival rates, you know, doing the DML on the, the Titanic set. But I can also say, hey, well, let me change the layouts. Let me pick this one, look at my code here, and then let me look at the data that I sent out. So I can actually select this first data set and say, give me this one, and then give me this, you know, give me this data set. You know, and those are two of those files that we're looking at, except done in the grid, you know, V table form. And I want to take that a step further. I can say, well, you know what? All of this is awesome. I need this to run, you know, for my process, but I'm only going to visualize this guy. So let's take out zero and we're going to send him, uh, we're going to send it out to downstream. So that way, when I pull out this block, it's, it should be. When I pull out this block, it's now sending fully into closure script, you know, this entire data set that I can then do stuff with. Um, and if we go back to this example, which I don't know why I like, I did that. And, oh, yeah. Do I even need it for this one? I'm using, I'm using hex data set. So let me do uh, three, two, nine. Always, always test your demo flows, kids. Okay, cool. So same kind of thing. It's another another GitHub readme thing. It's taking the CSV stocks, um, doing something to it, pulling out Map Super Reader. Except in this time, I'm pulling it out and actually, you know, drawing a bar with it. You know, from from the closure um, uh, data set ML. And just like before. You know, I can downstream stuff since this data sets now in, now in closure. And just to prove that this is like connected, uh, let me go, hopefully we can still see that bar. Uh, I can go down here and say, um, yeah, let's um, filter this to be one date or two dates. And you can see downstream, it re-renders, it pushes out to here. So, so again, more of the same thing, but cool because now I'm, actually running like, you know, back in arbitrary back in closure code, bringing it into this environment and then, you know, doing stuff with it. Were someone going to say something? I cut some off there, I think. Oh, I was just asking, yeah, with the, with the, the, the main way to, to load libraries and in, in uh, code, is it, you said that through the, through the main REPL or additional REPLs or is there like a depths.eden thing or? No, I mean, these two REPLs I have here are basically just, like line again, you know, that I threw some libraries in, nothing's, but it could be, it could be a base REPL of your project that has all your own stuff loaded, right? And it connects to it and uh, Rabbit just treats it as another input output. You know, like I, I can have a closure REPL that spits out like hiccup vectors, 
And Closure doesn't know what it is, but Rabbit's going to be like, oh, like, I know how to draw this. So it'll just draw it because it's already in its world, um, which makes it kind of cool. Um, so yeah, external external repls, um, you know, do whatever you want. Um, and you would just load those up in your regular IDE kind of thing? Yeah. Yep. And then, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, in the config file for Rabbit, you can say, you can say, always connect to this other REPL. And then instead of custom REPL, you can just say like, I think it's like, um, like, you know, like EXD REPL and it's like a fixed thing on the server. But in this case, I'm literally just saying like totally arbitrary, you know, connections. So I want to use like two or three. Um, but yeah, and that's like a really kind of cool way to, uh, and where is this? Uh, yeah, you know, you can see we have the input in the two values here. Um, so just do one last thing and I would love to be attacked with questions. Um, because we're on the, because I'm, I don't know how many guys know like the Brett Victor and the direct manipulation and that, you know, um, doing things as much as you think of it. It's a whole like thesis that he did like seven, eight years ago. He's a famous, like, I don't know what you call him, a UI designer or a UI visionary. I, I don't know what the hell you'd call him, but awesome stuff. And he has this famous video where he does this like, like tree, you know, um, and I, I'm doing a shitty version of that. So uh, where is it? Yeah. He has this whole, so this is um, a canvas tree connected with a bunch of atoms, right? So these aren't direct linkages from Rabbit. These are atom DRFs going into this tree. And he has this whole um, thesis about, you know, when we're programming and we're, you know, typing things. Yeah, sorry about the, yeah. <laughs> sorry about the scale. We've, we've gone, we've gone sideways. He has this whole thing about, hey, like, if I don't know, if I'm typing stuff, I don't get a feel for you know what it is I'm doing by typing, and that's when we came kind of into the. Um, I wish you could make that bigger, like, hey, like you know, you know, <laughs> you can't even see it. Uh, basically, basically, like you know, scrubbing values and changing values and seeing things change in the code, so I can get a feel for what it is I'm doing instead of just having to like guess, pretend I'm the computer in my head, and uh, you know, guess what it's going to be. Uh, I want to know, you know, what that feels like so I can end up with, you know, better values or a better understanding of what it is that I'm doing, right? Um, so this is just, a, he has a fancier tree. My tree is not quite as sexy, but same, uh, same, same concept, right? It's that kind of um, observable type programming. Um, and I, I want to do that, as, you know, wherever I can, especially for building stuff that, you know, other humans consume. And he has a speech where he says, you know, Hey, when I when I manipulate this particular value, I can see the you know blossom shimmering, and you know he says, you know these are the thoughts we cannot think. You know this is something I never would have seen if I was just hunting and pecking integers. Um, I had to actually play with it to see where we're going. So again, all that business stuff, and then back to like more art stuff. But um, yeah, so I hope people have questions. Um, I appreciate uh, you listening to me for as long as you did. Um, but yeah, so that's that's Rabbit. We're in Alpha One right now. You can download the jar off the website. Um, more coming. It'll it'll probably be open sourced at some point in the future. But I want to clean it up more. Um, but yeah, saves things locally. Runs on your local machine. Doesn't hit any other services. Doesn't do anything. It's just meant for your machine right now. Um, if you go to datarabbit.com, it's literally running Rabbit, but without the closure version. Just all CLJS blocks. So. Uh, it may be confusing, but maybe after this talk, it'll make more sense. Um, so yeah, please uh, ask questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brian. So much to think about now. Uh, we have 15 minutes to the official time. So maybe we could have some short questions and answers now for these 15 minutes and then some conclusion. And then those who wish to stay could stay longer, maybe. Um, yeah, uh, any question? Do we just go? I'm raising my hand, but I don't know if we're getting called on. Sure. <clears throat> um, so I'm getting on in years, and one of the big things that I have found um, frustrating is constantly having to change. For things that deal, I love the the visual sliders, all of that kind of um, visual tooling. I have a lot of sympathy for that. Um, when there when there are areas where I have to do a lot of text manipulation, um, I decided a couple of years ago that I was kind of done learning additional editors. So it, um, I would love to be able to say, hey, 
look, you've got a REPL here. Great, I'm gonna connect via Emacs or VS Code or whatever my normal comfortable editing tooling is uh, for te text manipulation. Is, um, is there a story or a potential story for something like that in here? Yeah, I've been experimenting with some stuff because the at the end of the day, even if I have the greatest, um, I think like Next Journal has a really cool like you know editor with a bunch of stuff in it. People are never going to be quite comfortable with it, so I'm I'm experimenting with ways to have like an Emacs cider connection, right? That also sends it into a block, but I'm trying to figure out how that would work or if that's even the right way to tackle it. But yeah, I definitely share your your sympathies there. Um, for, for sure. Um, so that's definitely something it's, it's on my, it's on my list of stuff, right. That I'm trying to uh, look into um, whether it's just, you know, pasting it there and executing it or something a little more custom. I don't know, you know, um, so I'm open to suggestions on that front, but definitely something that I mean that I'm looking at because, you know, the code, the code mirror is cool, but I, I use VS code like Calva and like, I do a lot of, you know, you know, parentheses jumping and stuff that this can't do, and it, it pisses me off to no end. So yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm with you. So it's, it's the little things, Cheers. right? Like, uh. <laughs> and they're all different little things for different people, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the tough thing. Thanks. So, cur so currently, you can't you can't edit that code outside of the, the Rabbit Canvas. Um, I mean, it could save an EDN file, but the format's not something you'd want to do. What I'm what a, one thing, so right now, as you save it, it's a big EDN file, all the metadata and all the code. Uh, this doesn't really answer your question, but I'm trying to um, come up with a way, or excuse me, to be able to save it as an uh, unpacked file. So each block will have its own CLJ, CLJS file. So to be easier for like, you know, source control, but that's more of like an ingesting and that kind of thing. But I suppose you could have the, the, server, the server process look at, that directory structure of the block code and then just update the blocks. I don't know if that would get, I don't know if that would mess up the the rendering. Probably not. Like that actually may be a way to do it. Like have like kind of a kind of like when you're working in like um like shadow CLJS something, right? Where it's watching the, the file structure to re recompile. I could probably literally watch the directory and then just import that changed file. And then when it gets changed, Rabbit will re-render um, because it's something had changed. Um, that actually may be an easy way to do that because then you could have your Emacs or whatever open to that directory and have rabbit over here and you'd have like the spatial composition of the things but also control of the files themselves right and not have to deal with uh i wouldn't have like you know you wouldn't have the dope ass editor <laughs> but, but you know what i mean like it would be it would be a way around that that wouldn't be super crazy so that's yeah another another thing you might want to look at is there are a number of um editors out there for using either like Vim or Emacs. Some of them may have even been able to kind of so, um, use your own default editor. Unlike the previous session, I don't have any prizes to give out. I'm just going to tell you how to live your life. Yeah. Talk is actually about a way of living your life that. Yeah, classic. Inventing on principle by Brett Victor. Look that up. Jamie, thank you. <laughs> Following your passion or doing something you love. It sounds like someone was getting started already um, taking in Brett Victor. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great talk. Um, is uh, is my microphone working? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. You, you okay, got cool. cut off a little bit with the-, the... Yeah, yeah, I, was, I, was, I wanted to make sure about that. Okay, anyway, um, uh, it, yeah, so there are a few plugins out there that, that you can use to try to like open a buffer in Vim or Emacs and whatever, and um, uh, I'm, yeah, it may just be worth looking at it as another model. Like it'd be pretty sweet if you like hit a key combo and then like whatever you set up is like your editor is able to pop up, open that that buffer, edit it, save it, close it, and then like you're kind of back into that realm. Cause like that that would, that would kind of feel like the optimal flow, I think, where probably a lot of the stuff you'd be putting in, you don't need your editor, but like if you're actually sitting down to write some code, like that's when you want to pull it up into something that feels feels sort of um natural. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think I think that'd be really cool. But yeah, it'd be worth you know, you have to do a little, little archaeology to see like what's been done there and whether it whether it actually makes sense or. Yeah, no, that's totally totally great. But what I kind of like um, about this a little bit is, I like that you can just kind of run the jar, boot up, and just jump in and be typing stuff. I think there's a lot of possibilities here for you know, teaching. You know, like people learning how to 
um, manipulate certain things, being able to see the result right away and like organize their thoughts in that way. But yeah, totally for hardcore stuff, um, that would be something to look into for sure. I may ask you guys a question since I have y'all here. Um, so if I go back to this Bigfoot thing, I get a lot of people, to, I mean, obviously this is kind of messy. I didn't do a whole lot of work in it, like presenting how it looks on the graph. I get a lot of people saying, well, why can't there be a notebook mode? I'm like I could totally make a notebook like editor that looks at the linear progression and strings things along that way. But I, I always have to ask like, how is that better than something non-linear like this, right? Is there like, am I missing something in the scheme of things? Like if you imagine this as a straight line of things that all work on each other, that's kind of the same concept of this, except without the branching paths. Um, is it worth something like this, having like a editor that instead of it being this single thing, was all the things linearly arranged together? Um, just something I want to throw out there because I'm not quite sure if I'm thinking about that the right way. I view uh, that as actually, a, a, it's not an either or. It's act, mm -hmm. it, potentially a both thing. Like I would love to, <laughs> I, I, I like um, Clerk quite a bit and I could very clearly see like, oh, look, I could get a visual representation of like Clerk workbook, uh, notebook, um, tagging together the atoms and the, um, the, the data values. Um, and there have been other examples out there of saying, hey, I'd like to focus on this section of code and I could um, of the notebook and see that represented as one of these e smaller editor environments. I, so okay. I would I see them as complementary as opposed to like oh I'm missing something. It's well both of them are potentially missing something. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. So yeah, it's something that's not super difficult. I was just like I've done all the hard work with the execution and dependencies and everything. It's like like I could just you know hey here's my one linear flow and another linear flow and let me show it in a vertical or horizontal notebook. As a bunch of editors because it seems like oh, what a lot of people like expect from a tool like this as opposed to this and a lot of people are like oh like you know yeah. what is that um I, I think you have something more kind of unique and interesting here which is you already have this way that you can take pieces that you've constructed and recompose them right what is a view composer or whatever so like i think you should leverage either that or maybe even just like the plain text or like a markdown kind of mode whatever um, mm -hmm. i'm not sure if the plain text is is marked down kind of friendly or not but something that would let you um uh, cause like, <laughs> I feel like one of the problems with like the conventional notebook flow is like, it makes it like, right. If data scientists is kind of nice, like this sort of explorative, uh, place, mm -hmm. but then when you want to present that to people, it's almost like you, you end up with a lot of the, um, oftentimes a lot more of the implementation details than you might actually care about d depending on what audience you're sort of working with. If you're working with technical audience, you know, they might be interested in that, but, but oftentimes not. And you'd want to be able to be a little bit more picky and choosy about what kind of goes in and goes and doesn't. And that's where I think like the traditional notebook environment kind of falls on its face when you get to publishing. Um, there's still no real great like IPython notebook to like publishable, you know, document sort of uh, uh, thing out there that just, that's really gained traction. And I think that's for me with Oz, like that's been one of my motivating sort of um, uh, use cases is like, I want to generate like nice looking documents that you have control over how they render and, you know, be able to use it as a static site generator or log, you know, thing or whatever. Um, and so what I see for you as being really cool is if you can take all these pieces them and then stitch them together in something like a document with a compose view, um, you can add all of your text and everything that's explaining, you know, here, we're going to look at blah, 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 blah. Um, but like, you know, just drag those pieces in as, as inputs. And, um, to me, that's like the best of both worlds is, um, you know, being able to, um, uh, have this super dynamic exploratory uh playground but then then compose those individual pieces into either again um i mean it, uh, yeah like, yeah maybe i'll rephrase another way. i think uh, at least in potential with what you've done like that's so exciting is that it kind of unifies the idea of like a uh um a um what do you call it like a um explorer view or um dashboard i think it, yeah it was the word used mm -hmm. um like a dashboard uh generator plus like something that could actually generate really nice documents. Um, so that's that's my kind of two cents on that. Um, no, that, that makes sense. I mean, I have I, I have a, a markdown block just for that reason, because at some point I was like, yeah, yeah. I just want to I just want a title, right? I don't want to have to like write a bunch of hiccup every time just to make a title, right? Yeah, um, so yeah. something like this, if I'm just doing a label and you know, I have, of course, because because I'm an asshole, 
I made it CSS <laughs> CSS enabled so that you know I want to I want to hack the markdown but still same same deal right um yeah because I, I got to I don't know if, I don't know if somebody mentioned this but it was like I had an output of something and I think it was like an account from a database something and it was just like I don't know some value and then you know showing as the integer and I was like well it would be great if I could just say hey just like send this to the markdown block and then yeah, when exactly. you're in the markdown block yeah. have the yeah. markdown block just give me that text, right? Because a lot of times it's just what you want to do. And you can throw that on a dashboard without having to do like, because before I was literally doing like Flexbox for every single component, you know, which is yeah, great yeah. if you want to spend the time doing that, but you don't yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, generally. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, by the way, we have three minutes to the official time. Maybe a few people may need to leave. So maybe Ryan, it could be a good time to say some conclusion. And then those who could wish to stay would stay, I guess, and chat further. Sure. So my conclusion is uh, thank you very much for, <laughs> for going with me, uh, explaining this. Um, I don't even know what to call it. You know, it's one of those things that's kind of hard to like, people are like, oh, what is your one sentence elevator pitch? It's like uh, spatial code visualization. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's really something you kind of have to like look at and understand like, you know, uh, what a spatial like notebook is. But anyways, uh, thank you very much. You know, datarabbit.com, uh, Twitter, Ryrobes, um, always changing stuff. Love to hear people's ideas. Um, got a lot of great feedback here, but um, yeah, no, thank you so much for spending 90 minutes, one minutes with me on a, on a, on a Friday. And thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, so enlightening. Thank you so much, Ryan. And uh, I guess if you wish to stay a little bit, then we could keep recording for a while. Does sure. it make sense? I'm, yeah, I'm great. I'm good. How's it going? Thanks. Yeah, so one thing that I'm quite interested in is how hard would be like, for example, supposing I have a project that does not have data rabbit on it, it's just a normal closure script project. How hard would it be like to inject data rabbit on it now or in the future? Um in terms of bringing, I mean, you could bring pieces of it into this canvas pretty easily because I, like I said this earlier, something that I tried really hard to do is like not make this a data tool, but make it make it an actual closure script and closure tool where anything you do should just work, right? If the library is there, you know, et cetera. Um, so I don't know, I, 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 I really wanted to make sure that anything you run here with very few exceptions would run anywhere else, you know, not just here. Um, so I, I'm hoping that, pretty high but there's some stuff like the view composer that is i guess that's i guess you could say that's like more of a magic thing that only works here but it's literally just like composing boxes and you know arranging them it's nothing groundbreaking but being able to do it in that way is what the cool thing is so um i guess it depends on what, what it is right um but i'm hoping i'm hoping high because i don't i don't want to be like special magic tool right i want it to be a closure tool and learn something here and use it somewhere else, right? All these like fancy tools, people get so deep into them and they spend their whole career on these certain tools. And then like, they're not actually learning anything. They're just learning how to like use tool X, you know? They're not learning necessarily CSS or JavaScript or Python. They're just learning like, hey, I know Tableau calculations. That's cool if you want a Tableau job. But otherwise like, you know, I'm, <laughs> you know, it's kind of yes. like that, that, that like walled in kind of thinking. And I got so sick of that. With this like proprietary thing, so I want to make sure that you can do anything. And there's something that works in closure closure script that does not work here. Like for example, um, I have a problem with um, with async because I'm not using I'm not using WebSockets yet. So in order to get a response back from the server, I have to actually ask for it. You know, that's something I'm trying to fix. Um, and core async doesn't work in Bootstrap closure script either, which is a problem, which limits some things. So I'm trying to work on that. I, just, I want to make sure that like you could pull up any tutorial paste a bunch of stuff in some blocks and it would just work and look cool too. So hopefully. Um, Ryan, I, I, would, I would like to start by just saying that um, it's really cool to see you're keeping up with the tradition of making closure tools look awesome. It's like the font choice colors and so on. It's just like clerk is to me the best looking notebook out there. And this is now the best dashboard thingy out there because it just looks awesome. So that's already like an awesome step in, in just having tools that look great and make people want to use them. 
And and it's it's funny, my, my, no problem. Lanard just said that uh, you want to remove the magic and it's a shame that people don't use the time to learn. And it's funny because ironically, I look at this and I think this is awesome because it allows me not to learn all of these other things that I don't have time to. So like one of the problems that um, we sometimes have is that if you want to build an internal tool, like we have this very, very specific problem that we have right now, where we want to test applying um, a machine learning model to a new population um, that's completely different. Like say we have a model trained for transactions from uh, Germany. We want to see how it performs with uh, Sweden, whatever. And you can do this in a notebook, obviously, like you can just change the field and then run the whole notebook. But then it's kind of awkward because the whole thing is linear, right? Like you don't see where things are coming from. And then you have to scroll down. And like Christopher said, this is super bad for presentation. So I'm showing my CEO this massive notebook and like, all right, let me just change here the, the code. And now let me scroll down to the bottom to show you the graph. Mm -hmm. And the first time I saw this, I thought this is perfect because now I know exactly which block of code I have to change. I go there, I change it and it updates the, the actual chart I care about. And I, I just show him the chart. And the, the other option that you have nowadays, I think someone mentioned shiny at the start, like I had to drop out in the in-between, sorry. Um, the problem with shiny is that you have to learn all of these reactive concepts that data scientists don't usually know about. And if you want to expand it, you need to learn JavaScript and CSS, which are completely new things, which are orthogonal to my problem. My problem is train a model, show the results, right? Yeah. And even though I think it's always good, like you said, to um, you know learn new things and also, uh, as you said in the beginning, have this sense of coding and visualization <laughs> as an extension of art. When you're working with deadlines, sometimes it has to be put like on the sidelines, right? Yeah. And I feel like your tool fits really nice in the middle. Like, and I, I think it's worth it, or it has value on itself. I, I really didn't, would, uh, wouldn't need your tool to now suddenly have a linear uh, notebook visualization thing. Mm -hmm. for, for, for that, I have notebooks already and I would, use, I would use those notebooks to make linear code. But if I want to have something like you're showing here, say, oh, let's, let's just figure out very quickly how this uh, metric works. Make two blocks, show the chart, and then move on, but keep the block there like on the side so that maybe someone down the line cares about it, but you have this central, like you're showing here, this central display where everything works. I think this is super valuable. I just haven't had time to actually try it out. Um, but I think, like I said, this, this use case is something we are doing now with a notebook. I don't like it, and I want to try it doing it with Data Rabbit, if if that's possible. Just like sh getting all the machine learning models we have, getting all the configuration we have, pass it through a bunch of um, a bunch of these blocks, record the metrics as we go, and then have the final outputs. Because everything is DAGs these days, so you should visualize it as one. No, that, that's awesome. And I appreciate the, the kind words, but yeah, it's like, well, you mentioned the magic thing in the beginning. And like, I, I said that a little bit tongue in cheek, but I, I more, it's like, you know, do the thing. I don't have to worry about what it is, but if I want to understand what it is you did, I can go yep. in and do that. Right. I can see exactly. the code, I can see the output. A lot of tools just kind of say, Hey, we did it for you. Like it did a bar, you hit a thing and we made a graph. It's like, cool. But I know I didn't learn anything. You know what I mean? I don't know what that is. And I'm, I'm stuck to you having to change a feature for me to look at it. And this is like, if I make like a, like a, if I use Oz to make like a data light graph, like you can literally paste that in somewhere else, you know, you need to put your data in there, but otherwise yeah. it's the same exact code, right? Um, yeah, like yeah. Uh, it's, it's one of the, one of the pet peeves I have with the tool we use, which is uh, Periscope, is that they do mm -hmm. not have density charts. Yeah. So, so if I want, so if I want cool. to look at the density chart, I cannot do it. I have to either write Python code or, or R code. So I'm yeah. in a SQL tool and now I have to write a different language. And that just makes no sense, right? Because I cannot, I cannot extend the tool as I go. Yeah. Periscope, Periscope data is so cool in some ways. In other ways, I'm just like, what? what? Who? who yeah. Said it? yeah. There's like things that don't work. And it's just like, I was like, and maybe I'm just like an old school, like business intelligence guy. I'm just like, I have different expectations, but I was like, oh, you guys are so close to being awesome, but I can't do these like 10 things. 
So since we're here, um, I, I'm going to show one last thing that I didn't get a chance to do. Um, maybe this is cool for you guys. Maybe not. Is the idea of like subflows. So I had this like stupid little test flow here where it's literally like a React list um, for picking a value. It changes an atom, sends that atom to the block, right? So I, I, I'm rendering some fancy stuff here, changing an atom and getting a string. This is literally just, um, hey, all right, I, I crashed something. This is literally just showing the atoms. And this is just literally showing the namespace that I'm in because I'm using a dynamic namespace, which will make sense in a second. Cool, I have this little list, changing atoms. My application is beautiful, bam, done, right? So I'm in another flow and I want to use that, but I don't want to repeat it, right? I want to like kind of like reuse it. It's almost like a visual function. So I can come up here to my flow picker and literally drag that flow into this flow. And then you see it shows it shows the flow. Let me get rid of this. It shows the uh, flow, which is which is cool, but really not what I want. Um, so you see here we have these are the blocks in the flow, block inputs, block outputs. Well, this flow doesn't have any input, so I'm not going to use that. But maybe the output is, I want the output to be, this is my item, right? So this is the outputted string from that flow. So now if I manipulate the flow here and I have an output, it'll send that into this flow while keeping all this contained here. But it, even more than that, now, if you look at down here, my block and my editor panels, my editor panels now include all the blocks in that flow. So I can literally have an editor that is my list and my item. And it's running in that other flow, but right, let me change the output. So over here, over here, I can say, this is my list, send that to the canvas. And now I have that whole thing running of that subflow in this flow, almost has its own little micro application thing. I mean, a simple example, but you just kind of like, I see, go to flow instance. So to make it more cool, what if I have, what if I drag in another one? This is the same flow, just in the thing. And you can see it has its own state, even though it wasn't really coded that way, has its own state. And if I go up here, I can see, you know, the atom subflow test flow is like lit up. I can click on this and you can see, so these are the instances that were, let me unselect this. These are the instances that were created of that flow. So it operates outside of its own context in a separate context. So it can be used as like, as a block in this flow, right? I don't know, kind of weird to think about, but it's one of those things that if I didn't do, someone's gonna be like, aha, but can you, you know, can you recursively do the flows? It's like, yes. So I haven't come to a great, a great demo for this yet, but I can kind of see if I can get the performance to where I want it, I can see a world where you could possibly make, oh yeah, and I, I can jump into the instance flow and look at the instance, you know, values of that particular instance of that, you know, um, instance version of itself, uh, which is cool. But I can, I can see blocks that are created um, almost as micro editors for particular, you know, particular things. Maybe you have like a certain graph you need to build, or you guys have some esoteric function that does some thing that, you know, you guys call, hey, send it through the Goldilocks function. Well, you can get the Goldilocks function its own little block and, um, does it show up from here? Yeah, there's also a, uh, again, stop me if this is weird, but I can also configure a subflow and say, con configure myself as a subflow, call it whatever. And then if you see now on the left, this is this subflow that I configured now shows up as a base thing on this palette, right? So it's kind of like the subflow recursive application thing, but again, it's the kind of work in progress, but I thought that was I thought that was kind of neat because it's definitely like that's that's the hole you're gonna go down at some point. Anyways. Yeah, snake eating its tail there. I like that. Um, I, I have uh, I uh, <laughs> hopefully a quick question. So have you thought much about how you would extend to other languages? Like, you know, as a data scientist, we <laughs> we sometimes have to descend from the clouds and uh, and use languages yeah. that we don't that we don't want to use, right? Um, like you know Python, or or do we you know rather use something else with? Um, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, so have you thought much about like could you run like Python or R blocks or you know whatever Julia? If you you know if you want to do some higher performance stuff where you're you know building an algorithm, um, have you thought much about whether that's a thing that that could fit into this framework and how it would kind of play with the dependency mechanisms and everything else? I mean. 
are, uh, you know, how much, how much of this is dependent on like, you know, being able to analyze closure code and could you kind of extend that for other languages to any extent? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of this is based on the fact, you know, you know, closure, you know, data is code, code is data kind of thing. Yeah. However, I have played with the idea of trying to do some Python stuff, but do it in a way where it's not cheating. I know there's some libraries that allow you to run Python in closure, but I don't know if that's quite the same, you know what I mean? It's having like, it would be interesting to have like, what would it be useful if I had, let's say a Python block that still executed and passed its values as the closure system expected it, but was still Python. Like, is that enough or so. would I need to fundamentally, yeah. Like, cause if that's the yeah. case and I can use wrappers intelligently, like, you know, I know there's, you know, we have a bunch of stuff for R and Python, like, that would be super interesting. I just wonder how much it goes against, maybe it doesn't go against it at all. Cause if it's wrapped in a monster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, well, at, what, at what point do I, you know, wake up hungover? Like, what am I doing in my life? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that could, cause yeah. I've actually thought of that. Cause like one of the things, one of the reasons I love this like DAG view is because, you know, I love tools like Airflow, you know, I just hate writing Python. I've read so much Python as a DE and people think it's great and like, part of it is great but like you get to the point in your career where you just want to get shit done and you don't want to like fiddle with crap right or just type type things like boilerplate like yeah even react and javascript after a while it's just like oh my god like people yeah. people uh, people become experts in minutia not experts in building cool shit right just build cool shit i don't care about your i don't care that you understand props better like it's just like it's like a it's like being a chef but specializing in knives i get it but like Make good food, and then I don't give a fuck what kind of knife you use. Like, hit it with your hand, right? Um, you know, I'm being kind of crass, but you know, like, there's yeah. a lot of that out there. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. Again, I answered I answered your question with a non-answer. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I appreciate it. I mean, part of my perspective is um, uh, kind of being in um, in the nonprofit space, and you know, having volunteers and and that sort of thing. You know, we have to be aware of what other languages people are already using. You know, who might want to come in and help. You know. And so I think that um, it's one area where like, I really appreciate what NextJournal did by making in their notebooks, you can, you can have blocks with different kinds of code, like within, you know, a notebook that has, you know, that's the, polyglot notebook, true polyglot notebook. And mm -hmm. that's something that's still Jupyter, you know, you can have a closure notebook or you can have a, um, a Python notebook, but you can't have like, or, you know, you can't have one that's doing all of them kind of together. So I think that that would, I mean, that'd be something that I think is really appealing for teams that are kind of, you know, polyglot and, um, and, you know, where you want to be able to let people plop in with something that, I mean, it, even, even that aside, I think, um, even if you just have a closure team, but, you know, they're, you know, as data scientists or whatever that they're, they're using Python, they're using R and um, uh, sometimes it's just easier if you want, like, there's this one, like, machine learning algorithm I want to try out, like I could like wrap it in Python CLJ and like call it that way. Um, but like, I like the easiest thing to do is just copy some stuff from their, their documentation and like plop it in a block and see if it works. Right. And so if you can make that easy to sort of plug the values in and out of that from closure, then you've kind of, you've kind of, um, yeah, you can get the best of both worlds potentially. Yeah. 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 You're right. so just food for thought. Um, you know, yep. let, me, let me know if you want to think about it more. I'm, I, I think it's an, uh, an interesting problem. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's analogs for those data types. Like, I don't see why not. But to your point, like, it has to be, I have to be able to paste arbitrary stuff in and have it work, right? You can't do, like, you know, weird. Yeah, it has yeah, to, it has to yeah. just work. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But I don't know if there'd be, like, a Jython kind of thing running the background. Well, so have you, have you looked at LibPython CLJ yet? Or are you familiar with it? Uh, I've looked at it, and I've always kind of, like, pushed it aside because I, I didn't, I, I didn't see it was, I didn't see it as being very straight, straightforward, but I didn't spend a lot of time looking at it. So. Yeah. So um, it's actually, I mean, in some ways it's not straightforward because of what it's doing, but uh, like, that's actually what makes it, I think really cool is that it gives you bridges between the languages, um, which is, I think really what you cool. need to do this properly. So yeah. um, you can like wrap a Python object as sort of the equivalent closure object or vice versa. Okay. Um, and it's Maybe all kind of in terms that. of the, the stuff that's um, being used in like data type next and um, uh, what is it? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, tech, the tech ML, uh, you know, data set, et cetera. Mm -hmm. stack. 
Um, so yeah, it would, yeah, that, that there's thinking to do there to be sure. Um, it's not, you know, not, not necessarily a super, you know, obvious path forward and there'd, there'd be lots of technical problems to solve, but, um, but yeah, I think it'd be interesting. So, you know, if, you, if you're ever looking for someone to help think about it with or, or anything, I'm happy to, happy oh, yeah. to chat. Yeah, I've been looking at the technical stuff more lately, um, only because yeah. they have a lot of really good readers, and I know they have like some of that ported to uh, CLJS, and it would be great to have. You know, I work so much in like vectors and maps that it just yeah. Chrome is not good at handling all that stuff, right? Yeah. But if I could have like a smaller format as it uses less memory and is potentially faster, right? I mean, you've seen some of the stuff I'm doing in the front end, like you know the summing and the averaging and the group by, like. Doing that in closure script, like you really probably don't want to be doing that, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But it works, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. Like doing something like uh, I'm going to re-aggregate this data set, right? And I'm going to say, you know, sum this up and sum this up and do it by name. And it's like going to write this big closure script monstrosity, not monstrosity, but you know what I mean. Like this is not going to be as efficient as it should be right and waste a bunch of space it's cool that you can do it um which is like the thesis of my whole thing like moving it moving the train along but but yeah um the other food for thought the python thing is super interesting um if i could if i could like bridge the gap between the data types and just have the execution environment take in what i am already doing and spit out what i'm already doing in a way that under and in a way that the system understands you could do closure Python, closure Python, Python to closure, you know, closure script viz, and it really wouldn't matter. Because most of the Python viz libraries spit out PNGs anyways, which is kind of like the old school Vega way, which is super yeah. cake to use. Like it's super cake for me to interpret and show, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely for, interesting. Yeah. yeah, for me, I'm, I'm more interested in like being able to take in some data, compute an ML algorithm, and that's kind of the or, or R for like stats functionality. And I don't know as much about closures R or how, you know, I've, I've used libpython CLJ um, a bit now. Um, so, you know, I can speak to that a little bit more, but, um, but you know, I'd imagine the same kind of stuff would be possible. Um, there again, just I think about, you know, it's like with R, the, the value is that like <laughs> most of the stats researchers who've been operating and publishing for the last like however many <laughs> years they, um, we'll, we'll often publish stuff um, as as our packages, yeah. um, and so you know stats ML. I mean, right? These are kind of branding terms as much as anything sometimes, but um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, there's there's clearly a lot of you know wealth wealth of stuff there that you can just plug into, which which would be nice. Um, yeah, yeah, cool. Ryan, could I ask something? Um, Please the state the state of everything we see now is it a value you can hold as an a data structure and save as an eden file or is it more complicated actually well technically um i mean it was so I'm, i use reframe right so the whole app db that runs this is essentially i mean it's essentially just one big atom anyways isn't it um and when I when I save my my EDN rabbit files, it's essentially just serializing certain keys of that app DB, like the certain ones that don't have um, you know the evaluation result, you know, just like the code and the metadata. Um, so I mean, it's probably not answering your question right, but but yeah, I mean that's what that's what this save to server essentially does, right? It packs it all up, sends it there, and then when it opens it again, it's literally just merging that with this the app DB state it has currently. Um, if I had the dev version up, you could see like 10 X, you know, you could see the whole, um, giant, <laughs> giant app DB. Cause I use it to track the dependencies, the outputs, the, the connections. It probably wouldn't be super useful to look at by itself. Um, yeah, but you know, maybe, but, maybe, maybe it makes sense to generate this kind of app DB state in a program so that you have a program that can generate a dashboard. Does mm -hmm. it make sense? Yeah, yeah. I was also thinking of, at one point I had on my list, I wanted to be able to export like a flow 
that didn't have the editor, that it was just executing almost like a website. Now you couldn't make it static completely because there's gonna be some closure, like hooks, you know, I have to run some stuff. If it was just closure script, I could probably like literally just compile some type of reframe project that spits out a static, or a, sorry, a shadow project, right? And that would be super cool because then you could like use Rabbit as your editor, generate this thing without the editor, and then publish that, right? But the closure uh, pedestal piece makes that kind of weird. But yeah, is that kind of in the frame of like what you're thinking, right? Like I'm using this thing to build something, and then it has value outside of this as its own thing. Um, I don't know. Is that kind of in the ballpark? What what you meant, or did I take that? Yeah, through? yeah, yeah. And uh, that's amazing. That's amazing. And and you know, possibly, possibly. If that is actually, you know, dashboard as data, then you could have a program which could generate uh, many, many, many dashboards and deploy them automatically without any touch mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of the browser, say, right? Mm -hmm. Like generating this kind of whole DAG daily or mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I kind of kind of adjacent to that. I do have on my my roadmap. Um, so again, I like I like Airflow. I like tools like that, and I want to have a, a way for these flows we run like headlessly, you know, so that we wouldn't render the closure script parts. But you could almost create like an ETL DAG that would run, you know, just on as a Java process, and then connect to it later and look at how it executed in the flow like this, right? So you have all your ETL jobs running. And then open them up to a richer view where I can inspect the different, you know, stops it went, but it still runs as a bunch of SQL with, you know, DAG restarting, et cetera, um, which I already kind of have, but it's still closure script based, right? I need to turn it more into a general DAG and run it on the back end. But as long as I'm generating the same, that same app DB structure that the front end understands, then you could have a, a very rich UI to an ETL type tool, right? That also optionally can produce <laughs> visualizations, which is kind of crazy hybrid kind of thing that doesn't really exist. Maybe for good reason, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something that's on the on the list too. I'm super like, interested about this Python idea now. I don't know, but anyways. Beautiful. Yeah. We, is we're... There, uh, one question, is there any potential for, um, uh, like interacting with like portal or reveal in conjunction with these kind of uh, embedded repls. I was thinking, especially for reveal, like reveal is able to kind of inspect stuff that's inside the, the, the Java process. So it'd be kind of maybe the other side of uh, the coin there. Uh, maybe I haven't looked at those tools hardly at all. Like I haven't, I'm not really even up to speed on clerk because um, like I said, in the beginning, I tried, I tried really hard to get this out before I dove into that stuff. Cause it would just like, it would just, I'd be like, oh my God, it's all been done, why bother? <laughs> so, but now that I've shipped something, I, I definitely want to go and see what they're doing. Um, I, I didn't want to be, I knew that I would look at it and be like, oh, I got to add those features, right? That's just not like the way I was trying to go. But but yeah, possibly. Um, I saw Portal a little bit um, and it reveals more of like, a, is it more like a debugging visualization or kind of a step in, you said stepping into the Java process? It's, it's basically, um you know, uses the, the, the closure Java REPL um, and then basically kind of has a, um, I think it's like C, uh, CLJ FX, Java FX based UI kind of layer where it can visualize results for easier kind of selecting and, and, you know, sort of direct interaction with results, but also there's kind of like some sort of like plugins substrates you can build, I think basically arbitrary UI, but he kind of made a point that it's it's all stays inside your your in process and that kind of has nice benefits um, in terms of just you know I guess I, there is a closure script side of it too I'm not as familiar with that. Sure, right, I'll, I'll check it out. Actually, you reminded me of one thing before before uh, before Daniel before Daniel used me here. Um, it's kind of adjacent. I have this thing where I, I can turn on block profiling, which basically times the render for each of these blocks, and you can see in the bottom, you know, it shows you over time. How long it takes it, it does the server time but you know it's mostly the render time and then on top of that you're like yeah see like this one this hasn't rendered a whole lot but they're gonna be a little more expensive but on top of that i can also say hey 
render the average render time as a heat map, and I can see what's expensive and what's not. No, oh, that's cool. That's kind of ridiculous. But it's one of those things, right? Like, how do we how do we give information to humans? Well, I mean, I, you can obviously tell what block is expensive. Like those of us who do this kind of stuff, right? Without doing this, but this is cool. We're debugging stuff, being like, oh, like well, like these like V tables are you know a lot more than I thought, and blah blah blah. And like some of these are kind of like warm, but anyways, I think it's kind of I think it's kind of cool. I kind of again. That's really cool. I, I did want to echo, I kind of had to dip out for a minute, but just the, the 2D canvas, I know maybe it's not intuitive for everybody's cup of tea, but I do feel like, you know, the linear format of, of traditional files, as accessible as they are, they do tend to, you know, flatten out complexity somewhat. So, you know, in our, in freeform text, you, you know, you can sort of abstract around that, but I noticed like, you know, when people do two app, to do apps, a lot of times just that, that flat list is just, just not enough model the complexity of the world and i for a while was making my notes in like visio or OmniGraphical, just and just found that just being able to draw those lines and kind of model those relationships even though it's sort of arbitrary but that sort of being able to kind of just have more dimensions to those relationships kind of visually made a, a huge difference and i think yeah it's you know maybe not the end all be all for every case but i, I think to rule that out if, if somebody only wants to stick to like a you know a vertical linear thing it's just it's just flattening things out which is not maybe always what you want you know to, to you know, like you said see the relationships or you know or just even see some of the the complexities of the of the the data flow i feel like that's sometimes the photoshops too where just this kind of stack of layers is just not sufficient it's too too flat you know yeah, hundred percent i mean think about how we design applications a lot of times we do it on a whiteboard first right in a group session like Oh, this is that kind of that. It always makes way more sense on the whiteboard than it does when you know people start building. Uh, you know what do you want to call it? Like uh, you know the endpoints, etc. Anyways, but yeah, no, I'm with you 100. percent Very cool. Oh, where should we ask you questions if we want to try this stuff out? I have a question. Um, I, I mean, I'm on the Plagiarian Slack or Twitter or wherever. No big deal. Yeah. Rye robes, both places. I think most people here are probably on the on the Slack, right? Um, I'm on Zulip too, but I don't really use that very often. So maybe Slack's better. Oh uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I guess we're, we are around the two hour mark and that was so beautiful. And maybe, maybe it is time to say goodbye. Maybe at least the recording. Uh, Ryan, would you like to say anything before we? Stop recording. No, I've, I've said it all. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. So we say goodbye and see you on the next times.